Thank you, Bonnie. And now we'll hear from Brendan. Let's do a little change of equipment here. There are two basic ethnic groups. There's the PC group and the MAC group. The PC group refute. <laughs> The PC group is hegemonic <coughs> and monopolistic. <laughs> the MAC group is much more creative, dynamic, <laughs> on the rise, and insists on power sharing. <laughs> Just Please don't start, Mr. Chairman. I, I have to deal with the complexities of the monopolistic behavior of um, <laughs> PCs. Okay, we can start. I'm Brendan O'Leary. I'm Irish by origin. I'm a Catholic atheist. It really does matter which God you don't believe in. <laughs> I became a Northern Irish person by coercion. My parents were living in Nigeria and they decided because of the Nigerian Civil War that we would go to Northern Ireland. <laughs> because it was peaceful and they would, they would be certain that I would have a good education. In their naivety, they sent me to Protestant primary schools. That's where I was asked the question by a very liberal headmaster, what's your religion? And I turned to my sister Mary, who was beside me in the queue, and I said in my best English accent, because I'd been brought up with English people, I don't know, Mary, I think we're Roman Catholics. There was a deadly silence in the room, and I proceeded to learn the art of armed combat with each <laughs> young male in that very small primary school in a place called Clohy. Later on, my parents sent me to a Catholic boarding school, and the results are before you. So that's my origins. I'm not impartial on this particular subject matter because it deals with my homeland, but in consequence of my involvement in my homeland, I have become what is called an expert on power sharing. I spent the last year um, as the United Nations Senior Advisor on Power Sharing with the Department of Political Affairs Mediation Support Unit of the United Nations. Roughly speaking, the longer a person's title is, the more unimportant they are. <laughs> Nevertheless, I did try to bring to bear on the, the work that I did my experience uh, in Northern Ireland and my uh, knowledge of how things have gone there. This is a graphic, which I don't know if you can see very well, which introduces uh, my first theme on Northern Ireland. Have you ever played the game Trivial Pursuit? There's a question in Trivial Pursuit. Name a famous Belgian. Can any of you answer that question? Go on. King Leopold. King Leop. Very good. Excellent. Most people answer Tintin, who's a cartoon character, or they answer with the names of Flemish painters from the 17th century before Belgium came into existence. But the person who deserves to be known as a famous Belgian is Victor de Hont. Victor de Hont invented the rule of proportional representation applied in the, uh, the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly, and that particular rule was first used uh, extensively in European politics in the late 19th century and applied to the allocation of committee places in the European Parliament more recently. People in Northern Ireland will tell you that the de Hont formula is terribly complicated. That's what this graphic suggests. It's not. All you need to do is to understand some basic arithmetic. The very first time the de Hunt rule was used in Northern Ireland, the allocation of seats was uh, organized across the four major political parties in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Unionist Party, the SDLP, the Democratic Unionist Party, and Sinn Féin. The first party gets the largest um, share of the seats, so it gets the first ministry, you divide its seat share through by two, you look for the next largest number, you, divide, you give that party a ministry, you divide its seat share by two, and so on and so forth until you filled all the ministerial positions. What does this do? It enables you to allocate seats in a cabinet proportionately according to party strength without requiring the parties to bargain intimately over who's going to hold each particular post. 
It therefore suppresses the possibility of parties vetoing one another's um, potential candidates for ministerial positions. It's an excellent system. It's a Northern Ireland innovation. It deserves to spread elsewhere. What's the advantage of it? It stops the necessity of protracted negotiations over government formation. If there's willingness to have a government, then the allocation simply works mechanically. In Northern Ireland, the system is now used so smoothly that the parties actually met to agree on how the allocation process would go, so there would be, quote, unquote, no surprises. That's a remarkable achievement. It's a result of Northern Ireland applying the principles of proportionality developed elsewhere in Europe. Most people are hostile to power sharing. They think it's a bad idea. There are three arguments used against power sharing. One, it's futile. It makes no difference. Second argument, power sharing is perverse. It damages values that we hold to be dear. In particular, people think it entrenches undesirable identities. It produces immobilism and gridlock, highly undesirable, uh, blocked decision making. People also argue that power sharing jeopardizes some of our, um, so I, I, I use the terms wrong there, I'm, I'm sorry. Perversity produces the opposite of what you intend. Um, jeopardy obviously uh, damages uh, pre-existing values. The, the argument of, about jeopardy is that if we have um, power sharing arrangements, we're going to allocate positions on the basis of identity, not on the basis of merit or need, and we're going to endanger the principle of democracy, which is competition and majority rule. Those are the typical arguments applied against power sharing every, everywhere. You'll be familiar with them in, in the United States as they apply sometimes when we have a situation in which a president confronts a, a, a Congress controlled by another party. What are the arguments for power sharing? One, these three arguments can't be simultaneously right at the same time. Something can't be simultaneously futile, make no difference, and at the same time jeopardize profound values and produce perverse consequences. Something has to give. One of those uh, criticisms um, has to go, and it's obviously futility. Power sharing does make a difference. The second objection uh, in favor of power sharing is to suspect those who criticize power sharing. Those who criticize power sharing are insisting that their identity, normally the one that's uh, most dominant, should prevail. The, the most vehement objection to power sharing comes from the uh, locally dominant majority. There are others who advocate against power sharing who claim to have cosmopolitan and transcendent identities. Don't believe them. They're people with passports in their pockets. They're people who have a secure nation state behind them. They're normally uh, the propagators of a dominant uh, group's uh, perspectives and interests. The third argument in favor of power sharing is it's realistic. The option is either power sharing or filling graveyards on behalf of homogenization projects. That's the fundamental claim for power sharing. It's also a claim of power sharing that good fences make good neighbors. As you've heard intimately from uh, this morning's panelists, a lot of Northern Ireland conflict was local uh, and highly intimate. If you have good fences, equal fences, then there are some prospects that there will be sufficient security that neighbors can get along with one another. If you try and compel neighbors to be identical to one another, to integrate them forcibly or to assimilate them, you will generate conflict. By contrast, power sharing creates the possibility of sufficient security to generate some degree of pluralist coexistence. Positively, you can argue for power sharing on the grounds that it combines the possibility of justice with the principle of proportionality. And arguably, it provides a much better model of democracy. Under majority rule, the majority never rule. Under majority rule, a plurality which controls the dominant party and which controls uh, the, the faction which controls the cabinet controls the, the entire society. And that's usually a very small elite of the whole society, by no means representative of the median voter. By contrast, when you have power sharing, that obliges at least some power sharing between rival leaders who represent different blocks of the electorate. And in fact, proportional representation, because it guarantees that the government that, that is formed has an overall majority in the legislature, is much more likely to generate genuine majority rule than so-called majority rule systems. So that's the rhetoric. Let's talk about um, things beyond the rhetoric. If we um, think about democracy conventionally, we contrast it with dictatorship. 
at the very end, I'm sorry for the, the poor lighting. Is it possible to uh, adjust the lighting so that people can have some prospect of seeing this, these graphics? Um, I can't change the resolution. I'm not that technically competent. I'm a professor. <laughs> get a PC. Okay. Get a PC. See the, see the problem? Um, I, I'll, I'll skip these because they, they depend importantly on, on seeing the visuals, and it isn't going to work. Um, I can adapt. It's okay. Just let me tap my way through this. Um, if we look at the Northern Ireland conflict since the peace process began, there's been a dramatic transformation of party fortunes. The moderate parties, the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP, have lost their way. They have been superseded in their respective communities by Sinn Féin and the DUP. In one sense, this is a remarkable <coughs> transformation which most people don't notice. Northern Ireland is the only place in Western Europe governed by working class parties. Matt is depressed. Kevin is depressed. This is the only place in Western Europe with serious socialists in power. Working class parties in favor of large scale public expenditure, hostile to the market, in favor of public subsidies, uh, the entrenchment and protection of the welfare state, looking after the poor, comprehensive education, etc. It's the only place in Western Europe where working class parties are in power and middle class parties are a minority. Remarkable. But that's not what I want to talk about. Instead, what I want to talk about is the remarkable phenomenon of hardline parties defeating moderate parties in the course of a peace process. Why did it happen? Some people say that it happened because uh, power sharing rewards the extreme. And therefore, the Northern Ireland uh, process is an undesirable uh, international lesson that power sharing entrenches extremists and uh, gives uh, unnecessary sway to hardliners. If you look at what happened in Northern Ireland, however, in detail, that's not an accurate representation of what occurred. What occurred was that Sinn Féin and the DUP both moderated their political platforms and in consequence became more in tune with broader sections of their potential electorate than they had previously been. In addition, the respective publics began to consider voting for them, and I demonstrate this in the circulated paper, not because the respective publics were becoming more extreme, but because they realized that they respectively needed champions of their communities to effectively negotiate for them. If you're a unionist, you don't want Roy Garland to negotiate on your behalf. Roy Garland's a Quaker. He's a really nice guy. He's not going to be a good champion for you in the negotiations. He'll give in too easily. He'll be sweet and kind and reasonable. <laughs> you want Ian Paisley. He's a Quaker. A Quaker is the nearest thing to a Protestant atheist that, that, that actually exists conceptually. Right? That's what I, a Quaker is somebody who's actually an atheist but doesn't know it. Um, <laughs> so the point in the paper is to emphasize that a power-sharing system in Northern Ireland, and this uh, is, a, is a generalizable lesson, can work very well if people know that they're voting for hardliners as their respective champions in a power sharing system and additionally know that those champions are not about to collapse the system and destroy it because they've been modified. They have credibility as hardliners because of their previous records of intransigence, but they also have credibility as future players because they've promised not to wreck the system. So the Northern Ireland story is a remarkable one. The SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party have lost sway to, to the hard, harder line parties, but those hard line parties have been successful because they're less hard line and now portray themselves as the champions of their respective communities. Is this a general lesson? Is it a mistake for moderates to make deals and create power sharing systems? Will they inevitably lose power in consequence? Is the inclusion of hardliners necessarily going to lead to the extinction or weakening of moderates? Not necessarily. The SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party had lots of strategic opportunities from 1994 to 2007 to strengthen their positions. And I would argue, we could go through it in some detail, that each of those parties made uh, very serious strategic mistakes which led to the erosion of their respective electoral bases. The um, simple Northern Ireland lessons, therefore, that I'd like to extract before moving to the wider world are, number one, including hardliners is sometimes much better 
than building power sharing around moderates. Moderates are nice people. You don't need them. You need the hardliners to make power sharing, power sharing work. If you focus on moderates, the moderates you should focus on are the moderates among the hardliners. And you have to realize that if they are to be successful, they need to retain credibility with their own, uh, within their own constitu constituencies. And their organizations have to be kept as disciplined as possible while uh, successful negotiations are proceeding. If you're involved in negotiations, you should not prematurely uh, try and simplify things. You've got to focus on what the agents say ca they care about and build agreements around the content of those declared demands and preferences. If we briefly note the successes of mediation in Northern Ireland, George Mitchell has been referred to. George Mitchell is a, a man of infinite patience, high, high uh, IQ, significant judicial skills, all very important. But the most important thing was that he was an American. He represented American power. And without the presence of America in the background, the Northern Ireland peace process would not have been so successful. What about power sharing outside of Northern Ireland? Does it matter? Does it work? Let me give you three very brief summaries of recent large-scale academic works which prove the merit, merits of power sharing. The first is by Arendt Leipart, the author of Consociational Theory. He shows, systematically comparing the major democracies of the last uh, 30 years, that in every case, consensual democracies which apply power sharing practices outperform majority rule democracies, not only in terms of respect for human rights and soft uh, subjects such as the protection of women's rights and welfare rights for the poor, but also on hard-nosed subjects like economic employment, growth, uh, and uh, general improvement in living standards. Power sharing is not uh, a route to poor economic performance. To the contrary, it actually will improve it. Secondly, Pippa Norris has investigated all regimes over the world over the last uh, 30 years, at least since the 1970s, and she shows that the more regimes have three particular attributes, proportional representation uh, election institutions, parliamentary institutions, and federal or decentralized institutions, then they will have better performances than regimes which have less of these attributes. And this is whether or not the regime is formally uh, autocratic or democratic. Basically, the more you uh, have something like power sharing institutions, then the better your overall governmental performance across the planet as a whole. Michaela Mate, Mattis and Bruce Savin have recently demonstrated that power sharing after civil wars enhances the prospects that you will not go back to a civil war, provided certain conditions are met. You either require proportionality or parity provisions in political settlements. Proportionality ones are obvious, parity ones less so. That's where you give groups equality, even if uh, they are disproportionate in size. So in Northern Ireland, you have two first ministers, one uh, called a deputy, but he's identical in power and capacity, um, even though the two communities are not identical in size. What these two authors show is that if you have parity and proportionality provisions in conjunction with sensible novel security arrangements, either new integrated security forces or parallel federal or decentralized and autonomous uh, policing arrangements, then you can have a higher likelihood of no return to war. In short, the international evidence confirms what is true of Northern Ireland in particular, that power sharing is a better way of organizing democracy, that it's actually better at hard performance uh, criteria of assessment, uh, both from the point of view of security and human rights provisions and from the point of view of uh, economic performance. So my response to hearing my, my fellow panelists from Northern Ireland was, I didn't understand why they were so depressed about the comparative performance of Northern Ireland's institutions. If we compare them to what life was like before, there's been radical success in the reduction of violence. There's much broader consensus on, on the running of institutions. The government, governmental um, ministers who are in power have relatively, uh, uh, relatively deep public support in terms of mandates. That, of course, has fallen a little bit in the case of the DUP because of uh, corruption allegations. But by comparison with some governments in Western Europe, they've enjoyed higher turnouts and higher levels of support 
than elsewhere. Northern Ireland is not a fabulous utopian paradise, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was, and it's remarkable in comparative terms. It's easier to understand that, I think, if you're outside of the country than, than if you're inside it. Okay, um, I have lots more to tell you, but my time has run out, so instead I'll give you the opportunity to interrogate me according to the best liberal democratic practices that are currently available. You might be able to read the slide. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll do uh, 10 minutes of Q&A for this panel, then we'll bring the other panelists up here so that we have everybody for a final wrap-up. Um, do we have questions for the panelists? I'm sure there are. Yes, can you wait for the microphone to come to you? Where is the microphone? Yeah, we have uh, runners with microphones. They're there. There we go. Uh, not so much a question as a couple of observations. Uh, one, uh, both Matt and Bonnie referred to the recent Supreme Court decision and uh, the movement to uh, uh, movement against what's called uh, material support of terrorism. Uh, as having to do with 9-11 and with uh, the current uh, uh, and with America's current situation post 9-11. That's not true. Uh, material support for terrorism in law goes back to the what was called the uh, Omnibus uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1997. That's where it first became U.S. federal law. Uh, proposals for the so-called material support of terrorism, uh, among other, uh, other so-called anti-terrorist law, go back to the mid-1980s and were proposed uh, before, and uh, legislation was introduced uh, in front of Congress uh, every session up till it was finally passed with the support of the Clinton administration in 1997. That's ironic because uh, uh, because of Clinton's role in the peace and the Irish pre peace process, and because that provision would have prevented the private American initiatives, such as the New York Council on Foreign Relations inviting Jerry Adams, from happening. Uh, to back up a little bit, material support, what constitutes material support, uh, as Bonnie said, is virtually undefined in the law. It's defined so broadly as in the Supreme Court decision, it could. Uh, it could encompass absolutely anything. And what constitutes a terrorist organization is to be decided by the initial, initially in the law by the administration that has devolved to the State Department, which puts together a terrorist organization list. In the law, there is no, uh, there are, uh, there is uh, uh, no provisions governing what constitutes a terrorist law what constitutes a terrorist organization or terrorist activities, meaning that effectively a uh, terrorist organization is one that's uh, uh, unfriendly to American foreign policy uh, uh, considerations or is so considered. So that is a very dangerous law. It is law. Uh, I'm glad that was brought up in front of a law school group, and uh, I don't know what can be done about it given uh, but it's uh, it's generally accepted now. But it, it's dangerous and uh, will and will certainly be used against dissent and against uh, uh, against develop against America playing a role as it did in Northern Ireland with uh, other insurgencies around the world. Does anybody want to comment on that? I'd like to comment on the the repercussions within the United Nations. There is genuine fear within the United Nations that the potential roles of mediators, those who interact with rebel organizations, for example, might have uh, serious problems uh, with respect to the United States in future. So, for example, I've recently been involved in the Darfur peace process in Qatar, in uh, the, the city of Doha. UN personnel were deployed to assist the rebel organizations in Darfur in uh, their basically building up their negotiating capacities, giving them knowledge of constitutions, human rights procedures, electoral systems, and so on. Is that kind of work 
now going to be construed as support for terrorist organizations. It would be grossly unfortunate if that were to be the case. Let's go to another question. Uh, how confident are any of you that a particular conflict uh, resolutions model can be applied uh, across uh, disputes to unique fact scenarios? And secondly, was there a particular model uh, that had been applied before that was used for the uh, uh, Good Friday Agreement? The standard kind of conflict negotiation resolution model is the is principle uh, principle negotiation, interest-based negotiation. You, you find it popularized in the getting to yes uh, uh, pamphlet that Roger Fisher, where you identify your interests, you combine interests. Uh, you can't combine co uh, positions in the same way that you can combine interests, and that leads to people making exchanges based on uh, my giving you things that I care about less but you care about more and you giving me things that you care about more that I care about, you care about less and I care about more. That's the kind of basic exchange. And you basically want that exchange to take place. The work at our center has been why does getting to yes not get to yes? So what is it in situations where you want that kind of exchange to take place but it doesn't take place? Well, what prevents the parties from engaging in that? And I, I think that uh, one kind of, of approach in a broader sense is to, is to begin to look at uh, what are the factors that prevent parties from uh, entering that kind of exchange of interest. And I'm not quite sure that that answered your question, but maybe did it? Brenda, do you want to try? Yes. I, I, broadly speaking, I, I think there are, there are two families of power sharing as fully, fully fledged systems. One set of families is, is territorial. Those are confederal, federal, uh, and autonomy arrangements. These work fine for groups that are dominant majorities in the territories in, in which they live. They work much less successfully for highly mixed areas like Northern Ireland. The second family of models are broadly called consociational. They involve um, power sharing within an executive and a legislature. They involve proportionality. They involve autonomy f for groups in matters of self-government like religion and language. And they involve veto rights. You can think uh, when you're going into any particular conflict site about which of these family of models is, is most appropriate. Um, the third uh, way in which power sharing is now frequently thought of is uh, an unfortunate one. It's, it's being used as a way of resolving election difficulties when an incumbent president basically loses power, fraudulently steals the election. The international community comes and says, ah, why don't you have a power sharing arrangement with the loser? Uh, that's, in my view, a form of pseudo power sharing that regrettably is being encouraged internationally as a way of uh, trying to inhibit outbreaks of conflict in certain countries. Much better, in my view, in those cases, simply to uphold uh, electoral standards and fair democratic procedures rather than to uh, reward incumbents who steal uh, elections. We have time for one last question for the panel. Yeah, I have a question, and then uh, there's two parts of it. And essentially, to summarize, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to summarize, uh, for the future of the Good Friday Agreement and the resolution of problems that were kind of put on hold, during the signing of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. Uh, one is fair hiring, and the other one is the investiga investigation of sectarian murders, uh, particularly those of Pat Finucane and Rosemary Nelson, who are defense attorneys that were systematically assassinated after government employees got on TV and said that uh, the problem wasn't just the paramilitaries and the terrorist groups in Ireland, it was the lawyers who were defending them. Uh, of course, this is in a semi-judicial form here, but uh, those were basically put aside. Now, recently, the British government did come out saying, um, and they, they did, a, after $290 million in 40 years, admitted that what happened on Bloody Sunday uh, was entirely the fault of the soldiers and the British government. Uh, immediately, several members of the House of Lords have come forward and say that to have a real conflict resolution work, you have to take things like this and the investigation of sectarian murders 
and you have to put them aside. And I'm really just asking the panel what they think about those things because we're talking about um, a healing process that uh, some people think is now stagnated. Uh, the same issue arises with fair hiring. The European Court of Human Rights, the British government, the Irish government, all acknowledged and accepted that Catholics were being systematically discriminated against, not only in the public and private sector. And w that was pretty much put on hold by the uh, Clinton administration because they said that if you can put down the arms and stop fighting in Northern Ireland, that that's a great place for investment and for the future, and that everyone is going to benefit. So I'm just wondering, as experts on this, because uh, I'm not really sure myself, I'd like to hear what you think about the future of what were, were considered by Americans, particularly very important issues that were put aside, and whether they can play a role in the future of a continuing peace in Ireland. Who wants to take that on? I, I don't think fair employment was put aside um, as a result of the successful mobilization of Irish Americans. The Fair Employment Act was passed in 1989 by a conservative government and it was one of the most effective affirmative action um, pieces of legislation in UK history. It's subsequently uh, been strengthened in, in various ways and it still applies uh, within Northern Ireland and the um, the commissions established by the agreement in those domains are, are working effectively, much less effectively than the Human Rights Commission, uh, which is another story which I, I won't go into here. The second um, subject to which you referred uh, was, is, is the question of what to do after a conflict in terms of justice. Um, people have a, a wide range of views on this subject. I, I have a very simple one. If, if people win if they overthrow an unjust regime, they're able to mete out justice to that regime. If, by contrast, there is no victor, then you won't get comprehensive justice. You might, luckily, if you're lucky, you might get truth. Uh, usually, you'll get um, a, a little bit of both, but not the full package. And there's a very interesting question. If the state were to um, grant amnesties to all of the public officials who behave wrongly, including uh, those who colluded with loyalist paramilitaries, those who um, perhaps were involved in um, assassination attempts on legal counsel and so on. Um, it would also have to um, thoroughly engage in amnesties for, for everybody else. And regrettably, there has not been, in my view, and it wasn't handled at the time of the agreement, a generalized amnesty program. There was something like it. Roughly speaking, the model is provided you don't return to violence, then uh, there is an, an effective amnesty. But, but not everything has been done satisfactorily to ensure the future employment of everybody who was, who was held um, either for actual offenses or for alleged offenses uh, throughout the period of the conflict. I was going to add something, but I basically agree with you. Okay. Maybe well, that, uh, it's a good place to end that. We're not going to end this session, though. We have a 15-minute wrap-up, and we don't have a break. So if you'll just bear with us for about 30 seconds, we'll bring some more chairs in. And what we're going to be doing in this wrap-up panel is um, each panelist will have two minutes for final comments. And I hope they will address uh, a couple of issues, including what do they think is the greatest obstacle to lasting peace in Northern Ireland going forward, and what do they consider the most important lesson of all the lessons we've been talking about um, from the Good Friday peace process as related to achieving peace elsewhere in the world, for example, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Sudan, Gaza, the West Bank. So um, do you want everybody up here? Is that the idea? OK, yes, if you'll just move up. We have one uh, portable microphone, and we'll just go down the line. Why don't we begin with um, Matt here? Uh, you, just whatever you want to say as your final two minutes, but uh, I suggested you might want to think about talking about um, the obstacles to the lasting peace in Northern Ireland or the most important lessons from the Good Friday. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> re respond to Brandon just a second here. That's fine, too. Uh, Brandon misconstrued my fearfulness for depression. <laughs> I'm not depressed. <laughs> Uh, actually, the fear that I have, uh, and I'm, I'm not being uh, negative in, with regards to the issue, is my, my fear actually revolves around the dissipation of energy and that 
things may stall. I think dynamism is important to keep things rolling, keep things moving forward. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, it's going to be really more important as time goes by that we uh, all the parties remain focused on what the process is actually about. And you know, this sounds corny, uh, but you know, uh, peace is not simply the absence of war. And whoever coined that phrase is actually very, very right. Uh, we've, we've got to be about the business of creating that transparent democracy and maintaining that transparent democracy that's going to be critical to the maintenance of peace. And actually, and, and this stems from Brendan's lecture as well, to the maintenance of prosperity. Kevin, your final thoughts? Um, I've just been throwing a curveball because I didn't expect this one. But um, no, again, I, I think I'd like to just to say to you, Brendan, that I wasn't aware that I was depressed or. Hopefully, I wasn't depressing everybody else. Uh, I suppose I would call it maybe, uh, maybe more uh, of a facing of reality and a dealing with maybe with a certain amount of disillusion. I'm certainly not depressed because we've come a long way from where we were. Uh, I think I was just counselling against taking it as an end result and thinking that we're now there. Um, I think in all peace process, you're, there probably is no such place as there. You're just where you are at any given moment, but it doesn't, as Matt says, there has to be a, a continual dynamism. I, th I don't think it ever stops. Um, as far as the uh, moderate parties are concerned, to a certain extent, as, as a former member of the SDLP, I, I would, I, I'm certainly not depressed for the SDLP because it seems to me the SDLP can maybe hold its hands up to being one of the most successful political parties that has ever existed. Because by and large, it has not achieved all its aims. And to a certain extent, I think the difficulty with the SDLP is that it has rendered itself largely redundant. Um, but the pursuit of prosperity for the whole community is at the heart of uh, the survival of the peace process. And I suppose if there's any elements of depression in my views at the moment, it's possibly because uh, of the economic environment that has overcome the whole of Ireland and possibly the whole of Europe and possibly even the United States as well. Uh, that at a time when we now do need uh, more and more investment in the uh, agreement, uh, there was never as little money to invest in it. So I suppose that's maybe one of the fears that I have. But um, no, other than that, uh, I, th I think that the uh, agreement we have stands as a, sh a shining success. And if there's one thing I would like to see maybe uh, worked upon is the, uh, uh, if it's possible to be done in any uh, country, is the lessening of the grip of the uh, senior civil service and the levers of power. Brennan? Thank you very much. I did not Im mean to imply that my two colleagues were psychologically depressed. <laughs> <laughs> it, merely that they sounded politically depressed. And uh, I agree entirely with them that the major question facing both parts of Ireland and indeed Great Britain is the economic maelstrom. And uh, I, I absolutely think that it's essential for Irish nationalists to develop a coherent and an alternative economic policy uh, to the nostrums that they're particularly uh, following in the moment south. And um, I think Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin needs to have grown up economics. Um, Northern Ireland is a very, very strange place economically. It looks like a part of Eastern Europe. Uh, very heavy uh, public sector, very old industries. Um, it has lots of talented people. It has the ability to transit to a service-based economy, but it's not as competitive internationally as, as the Republic. And there are tensions between, um, within Sinn Féin between its economic platform in the South and its economic platform in the North, which heavily depends upon uh, cooperation with the, with the British government. Those things have to be ironed out. They have to be fundamental. I'm optimistic in a very strange way. I never thought that the Northern Ireland conflict was fundamentally economic. There were economic injustices. The fundamental conflict was between rival national communities rooted in a colonial heritage. I believe that the key political questions attached to that colonial conflict have been fundamentally resolved. I think that common misery creates possibilities for uh, political co coalitions that might transcend uh, the historic boundaries. Let's hope so. Thank you. Roy, your final thoughts. Well, um, it's difficult, but the, the greatest obstacle, I think, actually is within the unionist community that there's no clear leadership or vision for the future. That sounds like a bit of a, as a sort of moderate thing I might say, but, but really the, um, actually 
yesterday, I think it was uh, Peter Robertson and Mark McGuinness who got the Peace Prize, believe it or not, from uh, Glen Cree. But the, the, well, of course, there's problems with Peter Robertson, but uh, even the, in particular, the Ulster Unionists don't know where they're going, haven't got a clear message, and uh, the DUP also are pretending to, to hold on to their, uh, I suppose part of it is power sharing, hold on to their hardline support. So they're, they're not really giving the message. There's actually something positive in this. Actually, David Trimble sold the agreement in a negative way by saying this will put Sinn Féin in the back foot. This is tying them up with a British system and so on. So there was no vision. I think actually there is a vision in this. I think it's a better society for everyone and it could be so. Uh, so that's a great obstacle, a lack of uh, vision. On the, on the nationalist part, I suppose uh, they have a, actually Martin McGuinness is playing quite a, a blinder in a sense that he's getting support, I mean, unbelievably from unionists because he is actually he is supporting the peace process and, and he's coming across as a decent guy. He's one of the nice guys, uh, and he really is. And in terms of the the lesson, I suppose the lesson is, I mean, Northern Ireland was an intractable dispute. It's, it's incredible that the changes, of, in my view, having been brought up in it, that it actually changed and we've got this far, that is incredible. This this goes back, uh, you might say, to, well, the, the present conflict of the early 60s or 50s or whatever, but I mean, it goes back beyond the, 